The second assumption we have to test is that the variance of epsilon, which is equal to sigma squared, is constant for all values of the variables x1 to xp. Now this is probably true if the spreads and scatter plots of the residual verse, say the predicted value of y, uh, a time variable, or all the other variables appears to be constant. The only assumed source of variation on the right hand side of the regression model is in the errors and the residuals provide the best information for those errors. The means of the error and the residual are equal to zero. The variance of the residual estimates the variance of epsilon. The variance of the residual is computed by taking the square of the deviation from its mean. We sum all these square deviations from the residual's mean and we divide by the degrees of freedom. This right here is the variance of the variable e, which is the residual or estimated error. Over here we have the true errors, which we don't know. And we have the size of the population. This is the variance of the errors. This is the sample variance of the estimated errors. Both have mean zero. When we're computing a population variance, we divide by the size of the population. When we're calculating a sample variance, we divide by the degrees of freedom. Because the error, the estimated error, the residual, is an estimate for the true error, which we're never going to know, we can say that the variance of the estimated error, or residual, is an estimate of the true variance of the error. Notice both simplify to this. This here is just the sum of squared estimated errors. This right here is the SSE. This is the sum of squared errors. We're never going to know this sum. So again, this is the SSE. And that's why the SSE divided by the degrees of freedom, which we call the mean square error, the square root of that is called the standard error of the estimate. Non-constant variance of the errors is referred to heteroscedasticity, changing variance. If heteroscedasticity is a problem, the standard errors of the coefficients are wrong. Heteroscedasticity is likely present in the scatter plots of the residuals versus time, the predicted values of y, and the variables are not a random horizontal band of points. Here we have the residual versus y hat, predicted EPR. And that looks okay. That's what you want it to look like. Here we have the residual versus the natural log of x1, or the TANF benefit for a family of three in log form. And that one looks okay. Here we have the residual versus the share of the population that is black. As the share of the population that is black increases, the variance in the residuals looks like it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So this variable might be a problem. Down here we have the residual versus the high school dropout rate, which looks pretty good. And here we have the residual versus the unemployment rate, which again looks pretty good. So it looks like we might have one problem variable. To test for heteroscedasticity, we can perform white squared residual regression by regressing E squared on the P independent variables, interactions of these independent variables, x1 times x2, x1 times x3, yada yada yada, out to x1 times xp, x2 times x3, yada yada yada, out to xp minus 1 times xp, and the quadratic transformations of the independent variables. Now this is a regression involving a lot of independent variables. So if we have six independent variables, you're going to have a lot of additional variables that are going to be included in the subsequent regression. Now because of that, I'm only showing you part of the regression output. We have the regression statistics and we have the NOVA table. The estimated coefficients for these variables, these transformations of the variables, and these quadratic transformations of the independent variables aren't shown. 
what we have is the adjusted R square and the F statistic. I have a video that demonstrates how to do this test using Excel. The video can be viewed at my YouTube site, the SNAR Institute. After going to the SNAR Institute, type in regression analysis in Excel part 4 of 7. Watch that video. If you have any questions, contact me via email or call my office number or come visit me in my office during office hours. Since the F stat is 1.24 and the F critical value is 1.66, which is found in column corresponding to the numerator degrees of freedom of 25 and the row corresponding to denominator degrees of freedom of 74 and significance level of 0.05. Since 1.24 is less than or equal to 1.66, sigma squared is probably constant. If heteroscedasticity is a problem, estimated coefficients aren't biased, but coefficient standard errors are wrong. If the standard error is wrong because it's too large, that will deflate the t-stat. If the standard error is small because of heteroscedasticity, the t-stat will be large. Hence, hypothesis testing is unreliable. In our example, heteroscedasticity does not seem to be a problem. If heteroscedasticity is a problem, you can do one of the following. Use a weighted least squares or compute Huber-White standard errors. This is beyond the scope of this course. The third assumption that needs to be verified is that the errors are normally distributed. The error is probably normally distributed if the chapter 12 normality test indicates the residual is normally distributed. The intuition behind this test is that the histogram of the residuals or the estimated errors follow a normal distribution. Graphically what you want to see is this red normal distribution curve passing through the flat section of each bar, which is the case for this bar, this bar, not this bar, but it is the case for this bar, this bar, this bar, this bar, but not these two bars. And the intuition behind this test that we're going to do is that this difference between the red height and this blue height is really close to zero. The null hypothesis of this test is errors are normally distributed. The alternative hypothesis is errors are not normally distributed. The test statistic is the one we used in chapter 12. It's a chi-square stat where the red F is the observed frequency. This EI is not the residual, it's the expected frequency and this is the expected frequency. The observed frequency of the ith interval minus the expected frequency in the ith interval squared divided by the expected frequency in the ith interval. We sum those up and we have k intervals. This chi-square stat will have a chi-square distribution if the expected frequency in each interval is at least 5. To ensure this we divide the normal distribution into k intervals. All having the same expected frequency. We have 100 observations divided by 5 equals 20. We want to have 20 equal intervals. When I say equal intervals, we mean in terms of probability. The intervals won't be the same width, they'll have the same probability. The expected frequency here is 5 because 5 times 20 is 100. We split the standard normal distribution into 20 equal intervals, equal in terms of probability. Standard normal values have a mean 0 and a standard deviation of 1. So too do standardized residuals. Standardized residuals are too complex to compute by hand in chapter 15 because we have many independent variables. So we're going to rely on Excel to compute them for us. When I say 20 equal intervals, I mean the probability of being in this interval, the area here, is going to be equal to the area here. And since we split the normal distribution into 20 equal intervals, and the area under the normal distribution is equal to 1, the probability of being in this interval is 0 0.0500. The probability of being in this interval is 0 0.0500. The probability of being in this interval is 0 0.0500, etc., etc., etc. 
The next step is to find the z value that has a left tail probability equal to 0 0.0500. I could find this value in Excel or I could find this value in the standard normal table. The only problem is that 0 0.0500 is not in the standard normal table. So we find the, the number closest to it. The number closest to it, there's actually two candidates. You'll find 0 0.0495 and 0 0.0505 next to each other in row negative 1.6 of the standard normal table. One of these values, 0 0.0505 or 0 0.0495, will be in column 05 while the other will be in column 04. Hence we have two candidates for this single z value. What we typically do is we average the two. So when we add negative 1.64 to negative 1.65 and divide that by 2, we get a negative 1.645. This number over here is going to be positive 1.645. 1.645 has an upper tail probability equal to 0.05. The negative 1.645 has a lower tail probability equal to 0 0.0500. Next, we find the z values corresponding to tail probabilities of 0 0.1000. We use 0 0.1000 because this tail probability comprises the area of two intervals. And 2 times 0 0.0500 is 0 0.1000. So what we do now is we find 0 0.1000 in the standard normal table. And the number closest to it is going to be in row negative 1.2. Well, you can use negative 1.28 or since I like the three significant digits here, I use Excel to compute the rest of these z values. Negative 1.036 and positive 1.036 correspond to z values that have a lower tail probability of 0 0.1500 and an upper tail probability of 0 0.1500 respectively. And we do this for the remaining z values. Okay, now we're going to take all these z values that we just generated, either by using the standard normal table in the front cover of the book or Microsoft Excel. Now we want to count the residuals that are between negative infinity to negative 1.645. To do that, we ordered the observations from the most negative to the most positive standardized residual. So we're going to count the number of residuals that are in the first interval, which is negative infinity to negative 1.645. There are four residuals that are between negative infinity and negative 1.645, namely 2.044, negative 2.021, negative 1.855, negative 1.778. So the first observed frequency is 4. So F1 equals 4. Then we're going to count the number of residuals that are in the second interval from negative 1.645 to negative 1.282. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, residuals that are between these two numbers. So the second observed frequency is 6. Now we do this for the rest of the 20 intervals. Here we have an observed frequency for the first interval equal to 4. Here we have an observed frequency for the second interval equal to 6. And then we have the rest of the observed frequencies. Now this E is not the estimated error or the residual. This E in this test represents the expected frequency. Remember the expected frequency for all 20 intervals was 5. 